Y'all might think you know everything there is to know about the Wild West, but hold on to your 10-gallon hats. Number 20. It's a short-lived era. The Old West was kind of short, you know, like from 1865 to 1900. That's when it really went down. But after 1900, trains were going everywhere. The Native Americans had settled on reservations. All the good land in the U.S. was taken. And cowboys became more of a Wild West show thing, not so much a day-to-day -day reality. Number 19. Many brands from the Old West are still around. If you suddenly found yourself in the Old West and stumbled upon a decent general store, you'd be in for a surprise. Brands like Quaker Oats, Royal Baking Powder, Baker's Chocolate, Durkee, Arm and Amp, Hammer, Fleischmann's Yeast, and Pillsbury Flour were all the rage back then. Why were these brands such a hit? Well, first off, they were known for being top-notch and dependable. Plus, they were pretty much everywhere thanks to the expanding transport system of the time. And the best part? They didn't discriminate. Everyone from cowboys to miners and settlers enjoyed them. Number 18, showdowns at high noon. You know, there weren't all that many classic showdowns happening right on the main streets of those Old West towns. Wild Bill Hickok gets the credit for being in one of the very few real ones. And it might have been the first of its kind that we know about. He faced off against Dave Tutt, a former Union soldier down in Springfield, Missouri, back in 1865. But forget what you've seen in Hollywood movies or read in those dime novels. The truth is, those iconic Western showdowns were a rare sight. Instead of calmly squaring off on a dusty street for a high-stakes quick draw, most folks ended up shooting at each other during drunken brawls or spur-of-the-moment arguments. Ambushes and sneaky attacks were way more common than those noble face-offs we romanticize. Number 17, the cowboy hat. All right, let's talk about one of those Old West myths, the cowboy hat. Sure, hats were pretty much a must-have for anything outdoors back in the day. But let me tell you, they weren't rocking those massive 10-gallon hats like you see in the movies. Nah, those became all the rage in the 1920s, thanks to Hollywood's take on cowboys. Instead, your regular cowboy, along with ranchers, farmers, and folks from all walks, sported a flat-brimmed Stetson known as the Boss of the Plains. John Stetson himself noticed that the hats being worn out on the plains weren't cutting it for the weather. Straw, silk, fur, and wool hats were either too hot in the summer or soaked up rain in the spring. The Boss, on the other hand, was a game-changer. It was lightweight, waterproof, and built to last. The inside was even insulated enough that you could use it as a makeshift water bucket for a horse. And that wide brim, it kept the rain off and gave some solid shade for the neck and eyes against the blazing sun. Number 16, not very violent. If you've been watching those Hollywood flicks or flipping through books by so-called historians, you might get this wild idea that the Old West was just one big violent free-for-all. I mean, everybody was packing heat, spending their days getting plastered, gambling away their fortunes, and having shootouts, right? Well, not exactly. In reality, when you dig into the real history, it's a whole different story. According to some legit sources, the Old West wasn't all that wild. Eugene Holland, for instance, says that it was actually more civilized, peaceful, and safer than modern American society. Terry Anderson and P.J. Hill backed that up, claiming that despite the Wild West's reputation for chaos, property rights were upheld and there was civil order. Private agencies played a crucial role in keeping things orderly, protecting property, and settling disputes. So, you see, it wasn't all just gunfights and saloon brawls. Number 15. You could see famous gunmen perform for shows. Picture this. You're in the Big Apple checking out a stage play, and who's on stage? None other than Buffalo Bill Cody and Wild Bill Hickok, spinning some epic tales around a campfire. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Cody put together this traveling extravaganza called Buffalo Bill's Wild West Show, and he had a whole bunch of folks on his roster. But the real headliner was Hickok, the legend himself. But it wasn't all about the stage shows, folks. Nope. They took it up a notch with staged buffalo hunts and reenactments of famous events, 
like stagecoach robberies. These guys knew how to put on a show, that's for sure. Number 14. Chinese immigrants were a massive labor force. Newly arrived Chinese Americans played a crucial role in shaping the American West. They brought a massive workforce to the railroad construction efforts, leaving a lasting impact on the region's development. The late 19th century saw a rapid growth in the Chinese American population, especially as people sought refuge in the United States during the Taiping Rebellion. However, these industrious immigrants had to confront widespread discrimination and racism. The era was marked by racially biased immigration laws, with the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 being a notable example. This was the first time the federal government had intervened to restrict immigration from a specific ethnic group under the pretext of maintaining order in certain areas. Despite the hurdles they faced, Chinese Americans made significant contributions to the American West. They toiled on railroads, in mines, and on farms, contributing to the region's economic growth. Additionally, they established thriving businesses and communities, leaving a lasting cultural imprint on the American West that endures to this day. Number 13, Dodge City was kind of dodgy. Dodge City, Kansas was a real Wild West hotspot back in the day when the Great Western Cattle Trail rolled through. It was like a magnet for money, saloons, gambling joints, brothels, and all sorts of trouble. To put things in perspective, the annual murder rate there between 1876 and 1885 was off the charts, with 165 adults biting the dust per 100,000 folks. That means if you were chilling in Dodge City during that time, you had a 1 in 61 chance of meeting your maker. But as of 2021, Tijuana, Mexico, holds the title for the most violent city in the world, with a murder rate of 138 adults per 100,000. But here's the catch. Dodge City's tiny population kind of skews those numbers. It doesn't take a lot of homicides to make a murder rate shoot through the roof. For example, in 1880, there was just one unfortunate soul out of 996 who got into some serious trouble. So was Dodge City really that dodgy? Well, it's all in how you look at it. Number 12, one out of four cowboys were black. You know, there were quite a few African-American cowboys back in the day, like around 25% of all those rodeo loving folks. Pretty cool, right? Take Nate Love, for example. He started out as a slave and after the Civil War, his family ended up sharecropping on the Love Plantation. But Nate, being the resourceful guy he was, managed to score a horse in a raffle. Instead of horsing around, he decided to sell it back to the owner for a sweet dollar fifty. With that pile of cash, he hit the road out west. Nate didn't just ride into the sunset, he worked his tail off and became a successful cowboy. He made enough money to live a good life and even start a family. And you know what really sealed the deal on his cowboy fame? He wrote a book about the Wild West in 1907 when everyone was already fantasizing about it. That made him a classic cowboy of the era. So yeah, cowboys were more than just rugged folks on horses. They were savvy, hardworking folks out to make their mark and their fortune in the New West. Number 11. Pretty much money for a young man. Those cowboys out in the American West? They were mostly young men just looking to score some cash. Back then, pulling in $1.25 to $1.40 a month was pretty darn decent for a young man. Think about it, it's kind of like what you'd see with oil rig workers or other blue collar gigs today. This is how folks like Nate Love managed to put down roots and carve out a good life for themselves. If they played their cards right, they could even make a name for themselves. Sure, the West was a tough nut to crack, but it also had its moments of fairness. See, it brought together men from all walks of life, no matter their race or background, thanks to the hardships they all faced. Those cowboys had each other's backs, and that's what it's all about. Number 10, cowboys invented burritos. Did you know that the word burrito actually means little donkey in Spanish? Well, it's believed that this originated with the cowboys of Northern Mexico, known as vaqueros back in the 19th century. These cowboys would hit the dusty trail with their trusty, easy to carry burritos, basically tortillas stuffed with beans and some fillings. 
The first recorded mention of a burrito in the culinary world came in the 1895 Diccionario de Mexicanismos, which described it as a rolled tortilla with meat or other stuff inside. While it's said to have kicked off in the Mexican state of Guanajuato, it soon spread like wildfire across Mexico and even made its way to the good old USA. In the early 20th century, as Mexican immigrants brought their delicious food to the U.S., burritos started gaining serious popularity. At first, they were all about that Tex-Mex vibe, but before you knew it, they became a hit nationwide. Nowadays, burritos are basically a global sensation. People of all ages and backgrounds can't get enough of them. You can stuff them with anything you like, meat, beans, rice, cheese, veggies, sauces, you name it. Burritos are the real deal. Number nine, Cowboy Durango was not just for fashion. All right, check it out. In Mexico, you've got this thing called a serape or Durango. It's like this long, colorful blanket cloak deal with fringes at the ends. You'll mostly see the dudes rocking it. Now, when we talk about a serape, it's the rectangular woven blanket with no openings. But in recent times, folks use the term for a soft blanket with a hole in the middle for your head, kind of like a poncho, known as a gaban or Jorongo in Mexico. Some newer versions even come with hoods for extra head coverage. These bad boys usually reach knee height on the average person, both in the front and back. Cowboys, especially those vaqueros, were all about the Jorongo. Why? Because it was tough, practical, and did double duty as both clothing and a warm blanket for those chilly nights on the range. It was like taking your bed with you on the go. And let's talk about the man with no name that iconic cowboy. He's rocking a getup that's pretty spot on for what a regular cowboy might wear. Well, except for that ultra cool cape. That's just pure legend right there. Number eight, U.S. Army Camel Corps. On May 10th, 1855, Secretary of War, Jefferson Davis did something quite unusual. He personally wrote a letter to Brevet Major Henry C. Wayne, and it read in part, Sir, you are assigned to special duty in connection with the appropriation for importing camels for army transportation and for other military purposes. The plan was to use camels as workhorses in Texas's dry deserts. But when the Civil War came along, the Camel Corps didn't stick around. Turns out, camels weren't the military MVPs they'd hoped for. Feeding and looking after these unused camels got pricey. So Secretary of War Edwin M. Stanton basically said, sell them. And that was the end of the U.S. Army's camel experiment. Good try, but no cigar. Number seven, cowboys are skilled specially in butchering. You know, finding a skilled butcher can be quite a challenge, but in New Mexico, they've got plenty of young folks who practically grew up doing it all. These kids, they've been riding horses, tending to cows, pigs, and sheep, and helping their dads with those old meat saws and grinders in the shed next to the tractors and hose. Their lifestyle and know-how could easily transport you back to the 1870s without a hitch. They can handle anything from horseshoeing to calf roping, bull castrating, and even building a barbed wire fence in that rocky soil. So, when it comes to cutting meat, they're naturals, hardly need any training at all. Number six. Gun control was stricter back then. This might surprise you, but not everyone out in the Wild West was packing heat. Actually, a bunch of those frontier towns had some pretty strict rules against carrying guns around town. It was all about keeping the peace and making things a bit more civilized. In places like Deadwood, Dodge City, Abilene, and Tombstone, if you were visiting, you had to hand over your firearms at the sheriff's office in exchange for a little token. You could pick them up again when you left, though. Now, folks who called these towns home, well, they could stash their guns at their place. Why'd they do it, you ask? Well, the Old West could be a wild and woolly place, and sometimes law enforcement was scarce. These gun control laws helped cut down on accidental shootings and all sorts of gun-related trouble. Plus, it made for a more orderly vibe. When folks knew they couldn't just shoot it out, they tended to work things out with words instead of bullets. That's good for everyone's health. And hey, it was a smart move for business and families. Knowing a town had some order and safety, they were more likely to settle in and call it home sweet home. 
Now these laws didn't always work perfectly, but they did their bit to tame the Wild West and make it a tad less wild. Number five, homicides were not a common occurrence. Have you ever wondered if the Old West was as wild and violent as the movies make it out to be? Well, turns out it wasn't quite the shootout fest you see on screen. Murder wasn't happening every day, week, or even month in most of those small towns, farming, ranching, or mining spots. Homicides were pretty darn rare, believe it or not. A whole bunch of folks were packing heat back then. The gun lobby might have a point there. But even with a smaller population, the murder rate in the Old West was actually lower than what you'd find in modern cities in the same neck of the woods. It's kind of surprising when you think about it. Oh, and why the big fuss about the shootout at the OK Corral and the like? Well, those incidents were pretty outrageous, even for those days. So, there you have it. The Wild West might not have been as wild as you thought. Number four, the whiskey was terrible. Imagine this. You walk into a Wild West saloon, hop onto a bar stool, and order their best whiskey. But when you take a sip, it tastes awful, like gasoline, even though the bottle claims it's top-notch stuff from Kentucky. What's the deal? Well, back then, they didn't care much about rules for making and selling whiskey. Some folks probably watered it down or mixed in other stuff to make more money. Can you believe it? Serious Eats even says some of the so-called bourbons were made from not-so-great molasses. And get this, they had funny nicknames for the popular whiskey of the time, like Coffin Varnish, Mountain Howitzer, and Tangle Leg. That last one meant it was so strong, you might have trouble walking straight after a few sips. Number three, Wild West Diverse Race. Yup, the American West was a real melting pot, and even the cowboys were a mixed bunch. So, in the late 1800s, you had cowboys who were black, Hispanic, British, and of course, plenty of white cowboys. But here's the thing. Those white cowboys often had the fancier gigs or owned their own farms. Now, the real unsung heroes of the cowboy world were ex-slaves, immigrants, and undocumented folks. They were the ones tackling the toughest, most dangerous jobs out there. If you want a peek at how diverse the cowboy crew could be, Check out the 1985 flick, Silverado. You've got cowboys from all backgrounds, played by stars like Kevin Costner, Danny Glover, and Rosanna Arquette. It's proof that the Wild West was a place where folks from all walks of life came together and rode the range side by side. Number two, brothels were common. Prostitution was pretty common out in the American West. And those brothels? Well, some folks actually had a good opinion of them. Believe it or not, some of those working girls were raking in decent money, and a few even chipped in for community projects. Now, if you want to peek into that world, just watch movies like Unforgiven and The Cheyenne Social Club. That brothel in Unforgiven was a real grim and dangerous spot. The women there are treated very poorly, and the boss lady, Skinny Dubois, cares more about cash than her girl's welfare. It's a rough life for those prostitutes, stuck in a never-ending cycle of poverty and violence. Escape seems like a distant dream for them. Number one, only two families survived the ill-fated Donner Party unscathed. So, here's the deal. Back in 1846, there was this crew called the Donner Party. They were all gung-ho to make the epic journey from Missouri to California in wagons, crossing the Sierra Nevada mountains and all. But guess what? Mother Nature had other plans, and they got stuck in a crazy snowstorm for a brutal four months. With their supplies running on empty, some of them supposedly resorted to eating the folks who didn't make it. Out of the 87 folks who started this adventure, only 48 got saved, and just two families managed to get through without losing anyone. Tough times, huh? Wow, what a ride through the untamed Wild West. We've uncovered 20 mind-blowing facts that will change the way you see this legendary era forever. But our journey doesn't end here. There's so much more to explore. You can check out our other videos. All right, that's it for today. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.